I am Andrus Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. We are with uh, Jerry Northrup uh, of the Math for Wisdom Language of Wisdom Study Group. He's giving us a presentation about uh, timberfish technologies and his life story uh, and what timberfish technologies too might look at, uh, you know, building further uh, the version two. So we will uh, have discussion with Ari Mountbatten O'Malley, one a philosopher and one of the co-founders of Lovers of Wisdom, and Ben DeVry, an ecologist who I met uh, in my laboratory of online independent thinkers, Minshu Sodas. I must confess uh, that uh, I forgot to press the record button when we were recording. So what happened was about 10 minutes in, I realized, oh, and everything went splendid. And so now what's going to happen is that we're going to Jerry and I redo this introduction will be even better, and then we will seamlessly cut in and it'll become an endless loop, which is a thematic to our cycle. So welcome, Jerry. Okay, thank you, Andreas. Uh, so I, I was going to start by talking about, you know, what is, is this all about, this language of uh, wisdom thing that we're trying to do. And... Um, Basically, the way I see it is that you and I share a, a similar worldview. Uh, we're both involved with the language. We have similar mission statements. And so the uh, the goal here is to uh, to try and, and map these together, to put them together and to see what we can, uh, what, what will come out of that. And I think that's going to be really uh, interesting and very important. So, um, what I, I did and what I would like to do would be to start with uh, sort of the premise and, and the conclusions that I, I come to, and then we can get into specifics. So uh, early on, uh, I became concerned about the reductionist paradigm, and I love science, but I felt that it really wasn't uh, talking to, to me as a person, to my consciousness, my, my actual emotional experiences and that sort of stuff. So I ended up thinking that, well, if I'm not going to use the reductionist paradigm, what am I going to do? So we're going to build an alternative. So I started looking at the foundations of science and philosophy and what have you, and decided that instead of um, operating from a point where I viewed the universe as being composed of particles and fields existing in space-time, operating under certain immutable laws, um, but that couldn't really describe consciousness. If it did, it was sort of an afterthought, an emergent phenomena. So I thought I would change that and start with consciousness and language. And the advantage of that is that I don't have to, it's, it's kind of like consciousness and language are like point and line in geometry. You don't actually define them. You describe everything else in terms of those. So I don't have to define consciousness. That's me. That's you. I don't have to define language. It's what we're doing. We're talking to each other. Um, but I do need to describe uh, the language or yeah, the language of the reductionist paradigm. Uh, and it has to be able to explain what that can explain if it's going to be valid. So I started really looking at, at languages. I started creating languages and constructing languages and looking at languages in uh, nature to see what was there. And it started to occur to me that, that all the languages, the various forms, whether it's art, music, uh, um, genetic algorithm that bacteria use, that there's similarities in structure. And so it came up with the idea of a hypothetical universal language that kind of uh, talked about these similarities and this uh, the similarity of, of structure. And then I, I settled on a constructed language, which I called Odo-Do, and I began to look at how this applied throughout the natural world and in terms of philosophy and what have you. One of the striking things with that was that it seemed to be very similar to a mathematical quaternion. And so I looked at how Odo-Do and how a hypothetical universal language should be able to derive numbers in mathematics, derive it from language, not try and explain language in terms of mathematics and number, but do it the other way around and where that would uh, that would go. And so um, having formulated that idea, then I started to look at how we can do applications and validations, how we can get some evidence to support this kind of worldview. 
So with that as an introduction, I, I then wanted to introduce who I am. I have a biophysics uh, PhD, but I really was doing uh, graduate work in microbial genetics. I became a biophysicist because I was taking uh, graduate level courses in physics and mathematics, like I took points in topology and uh, other statistical mechanics and that sort of stuff. And Syracuse wanted to do a, uh, a biophysics program, so I became the guinea pig to trial a balloon through that one uh, because I had basically done okay and in, in actually pretty well in the physics and math courses. Um, and I'd also published in science, so I had you know reasonable credibility as a as a trial horse. So one of the interesting things about that was that I was taking a course in advanced computer programming. And because I was working with mutation in uh, microbial genetics, uh, we had to do a project for the uh, advanced computer programming course. So I built a, a bacterium in the computer. Uh, I got it so that it replicated by binary fission and then it mutated and it could expand. And then, then I got called in by the teacher and the department head, which I was wondering what the heck I was doing because apparently my trial program was shutting the computer down. So we talked about that for a bit and then uh, they gave me a C for the course and suggested that I not uh, take any more courses in computer programming. <laughs> but anyway, I... Uh, I then, you know, got my degree. I went out to California and did a postdoc at the University of California in Davis. And it was in the middle of that that I actually kind of bit the bullet and realized that, you know, I love science, but it's not explaining who I am emotionally and, and as a consciousness. So I dropped out. I mean, it was 1969. That's, that's what we did. Um, so I... Uh, I dropped out. I, I left California, went back to New York City, moved in with Lynn, who was an artist I met in Syracuse. Uh, we've been together ever since. Uh, um, I started to write. Um, I had breathing problems in New York City, so we moved up to Western New York. Lynn started working with a toy designer, Fishy Price. I started working with John Ray Heyman at the uh, Center for Theoretical Biology at the University of Buffalo. And and John Ray and I got along really well. Uh, I joined his relational systems group. We worked on relational systems, maximum entropy theory. Uh, John Ray had started a, an experimental college. Uh, University of Buffalo set up an experimental college program and he launched one called College E. And so I joined in with that. It was uh, open to everybody and lots of diversified backgrounds, but it functioned as a cooperative decision-making collective. So university didn't care for that too much. But anyway, I taught some courses and we had a good time with that. We also started a serial entrepreneur thing where we formed a number of corporations to try and uh, get these ideas out. Uh, one of those involved a microbial tank farm, bacterial system that had evolved from my work in uh, microbial genetics. Uh, and things went really well then towards the end and middle end of the 70s, it blew up. Um, Jim Danielli, who was the director manager of the Center for Theoretical Biology, disbanded the center, moved it to Worcester. Um, the university got rid of the experimental college program, uh, at least our part of it. Uh, the corporations started to, uh, to fail. So basically uh, it all collapsed and uh, so I started then to take the ideas of this microbial tank farm and see if I could get it, uh, some interest in companies or other people to do it. That didn't go well. So in 1979, I got a job in a big advanced wastewater treatment plant. And that proved out to be really well. Now, as part of being a serial entrepreneur, the way we do things is you generate a... Uh, a, an elevator pitch, 30 seconds to say everything that it's about. And then you follow that up with a, a pitch deck, uh, slides and a presentation you can do in 10 to 15 minutes uh, to show. So what I'm going to do is describe some of the history from there out in terms of uh, elevator pitches and a pitch deck. So uh, here's the start of the... Uh, uh, the pitch deck that what I was using for microbial tank farm. Here, this is 1973. I'm working at the Center for Theoretical Biology, but uh, 
I'm actually growing weeds in uh, 55 gallon drums. I'm fermenting the weeds and creating a microbial biomass by taking that liquid and, and putting it into uh, five gallon pails, which are aerated and generates a microbial biomass. Uh, I'm settling these out in these pipes over here in the corner and creating this uh, microbial biomass. So um, then I was gonna feed that to fish. Here's the microbial biomass that I was gonna feed to fish and here is feeding it to fish. So the notion is that this is a new form of ecologically integrated agriculture, uh, that you can take a waste plant material and produce food and clean water and it becomes the agriculture of the future. So I, I tried to pitch that and uh, that didn't go anywhere particularly. So I got a job in this advanced wastewater treatment plant at the town of Amherst in, in New York. Uh, this was a terrific uh, opportunity for me because I had this degree. Everybody thought I knew everything about biology. And so I was running the lab and I was running the process as process superintendent. And this, this system uh, creates its own oxygen. It feeds that to the incoming wastewater in a, a bioreactor here. The, the biomass that's uh, produced is distributed to a series of clarifiers, which separates the biomass from the water. Biomass goes back into the bioreactor. The water goes on to the next stage, which was for nitrification. Uh, we also had a biological phosphorus removal component uh, back here, which was the first large-scale biological phosphorus removal application of wastewater, I think, in the world. So the plant was fabulous. We had multiple hearth incinerators. We had every kind of dewatering equipment you could imagine, all that sort of stuff. But what happened was that I began to realize that there's all kinds of other biology at work here than just my microbes. For example, if you look at, at the first aeration basin, which is covered because it's pure oxygen, and that effluent, a high biomass effluent, is sent through a distribution uh, channel. Um, and there it is set to the various clarifiers where the biomass is separated and recycled back and the water goes on. But looking at this uh, mixed liquor channel, I discovered that there's all kinds of worms living in the bottom of it. So if you took an Ekman dredge and you went down and you pulled up a gallon or two of sediment off the bottom, you found that it was a quarter to a half of it was worms. The rest of it was solid residue. So you could separate the worms out, wash the sludge off of it, and you had all of these, there were roughly a dozen different species of oligarchates. So these are aquatic worms. They're much smaller than earthworms, but they're long. They can be 10 inches long, but they're little tiny things like pencil leads. So having all these worms, I thought, well, let's grow fish. And so we did. We set up uh, tanks, uh, clarifiers, and we built a little pond right next to the wastewater treatment plant here, where we recycled plant effluent before it was chlorinated. Uh, put fish in, raised the fish, took the water effluent coming out of it, went back to the head of the plant. So the regulatory officials were all comfortable with this. And since I was growing fish, I analyzed them. I, I had this high-powered lab with GCMS, atomic absorption. So I ran priority pollutant scans on the fish. I compared that with what I could analyze from the supermarket. And the fish from the plant were as good or better than what I could buy in the store. So... I ate the fish. So I then presented this whole package at a Water Pollution Control Federation annual meeting out in Los Angeles in 1986. And I proposed that rather than have all this, this fancy control stuff for running a wastewater treatment plant, you'd grow fish in the effluent once a month, the plant superintendent, the town supervisor, and the Department of Environmental Conservation engineer in charge of the plant would eat a fish. And you could be sure that they would make sure that that plant ran really, really well. It got a big laugh, but uh, wasn't received quite as well back at the town of Amherst. Anyway, so in uh, 1979, basically, I had uh, I managed to get to my 10 years for the uh, New York State pension. And I was really getting driven out by the, or, or driven nuts by the po town politics. So. Uh, my brother and I formed a company called Bion Technologies. And we tried to take the experience that I'd had here with the microbial tank farm. We pitched it to a lot of big companies. 
They thought it was really intriguing, but nobody bit and suggested we go into large animal agriculture, wastewater, uh, agricultural wastewater treatment. So we did. So we built a, a number of big systems, 30 to 40 clear across the nation. Uh, here is one that was in a, a big citrus processing uh, grove down in Florida. There was a big citrus processing plant over here. It's called Berry Citrus. And they produced um, a lot of waste from that that they would spread around in the orange groves. And that raised issues with odor, water quality, and that sort of stuff. So we built a system. They piped it into a bioreactor, an aerated bioreactor, a secondary uh, lower oxygen uh, bioreactor, and then solids collection, constructed wetlands, and what have you. So this plant produced water quality roughly the same as this plant, but this plant cost $136 million. This one handled roughly half the waste load and cost about $500,000. So that kind of was, was what we were doing, but mostly we, um, we worked with uh, dairy farms and hog farms. Here's a system, a flush system for a small dairy farm in upstate New York. Uh, total confinement cows here. Uh, you recycle water to flush the waste into solids, eco-reactors here to collect solids. Uh, effluent goes here where it's aerated in the bioreactor and recycled back. Excess water goes to a second bioreactor and then it's pumped up to a constructed wetland on a hill where it flows down, ends up in the side and can be irrigated on the fields beside it. Worked really great, very high water quality. Here is a system uh, for um, 11,000 hog farm down in North Carolina. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been around uh, a hog farm, but they really stink. That is the big driver in terms of regulatory enforcement. The system uses a low oxygen nitrification, denitrification system, uh, and it um, eliminates the odor. Now the purple color here is from uh, anaerobic photosynthetic purple sulfur bacteria which actually survive in a low oxygen environment. But the big advantage here is that it, it didn't stink and it packaged the nutrients into microbial cells so you could put it on the land as a slow release fertilizer. So it was, um, was deemed very environmental friendly. The regulatory people loved it. So that was the buy-in experience. Um, after about 10 years, my brother and I started to, to burn out. We brought in some new management. Um, and we were a public company. We went public in, uh, I think it was 80, 82, 83, something like that. Anyway, we brought in new management. Uh, I stayed on uh, for a while to, to be the technology officer. But they wanted to focus just on um, wastewater treatment. And I wanted to do clean water, recycle loops, and raise fish. So John and I, uh, or, or that, that was, so I left, left Bion basically around 2008 and formed Timberfish. I've got uh, a pitch deck that I can show at the end of this uh, that describes some of Timberfish, and maybe some of you are already familiar with it, um, so we can do that. But um, as a sidebar, uh, back in uh, the early 90s, John Ray and I got back together. I hired him as a consultant with uh, Bion, and he was involved with forming a new company called Autonomics Corporation. It was set up by Gene Pendergraf, who had taken the um, first, second, third um, semiotic theory and pragmatism developed by Charles Sanders Person had tried to uh, build a specification, put it into a computer system. Uh, the notion was that it wasn't something you would train, but you set it up so that you had inputs and outputs and you just hooked it up to a, any kind of system you wanted to and it would develop a knowledge base as to how you could operate the system and how it could function. So, he started with that, and then in about uh, 1999, uh, Unisys, they, they sold that, or not sold, but they got out an agreement working with Unisys Corporation, put $5 million into the development of the autonome. And that started to, um, Unisys pulled out in, in uh, 99, 
So John Ray was looking for a home for that. I was uh, thinking that maybe I needed a home for continuing my vision of um, Bion. So we formed As It Is Inc. Um, and Bion turned out to, to keep me around for quite a while for the technology stuff. But uh, we, we then focused, AI3 focused on um, trying to do more with the autonome and developed, got another three and a half million dollars into it and developed a, uh, an application package called True Thinker, which was kind of a different kind of search engine. Uh, you'd hook it up to your computer and it would watch you as to what you did for internet browsing and stuff. And it would develop a profile for you so that when you wanted to go out and do some additional browsing to look for something, it would have a pretty good idea as to what you were interested in, how you approached it. And it would do a search based on that information. Um, that didn't work out either <clears throat> for a variety of reasons. And so um, there's a, a good description of where that was in 2007. Uh, John Roy wrote up a, a summary of that, but uh, that, that kind of petered out. And I then focused on Timberfish, which we incorporated in 2008. And I've been working there ever since. So um, what I'm going to do now is go back to uh, the screen and then let's talk about the autonome, which is based on Charles Sanders' birth. And so let's see. We'll do... This is the basic autonome specification. And to the extent that you're familiar with Peirce's semiotics, and he had a first, second, thirdness type of concept. So everything was done in threes. And this is kind of like uh, Andreas has this concept of threeness, which is, is similar in, in many kinds of ways and also maps to part of what I did with the Odo-Do language that I had created earlier. Uh, but this is the specification was groups of three. This was a nomad, monadic uh, mode, dyadic and triadic is based on the one to first, second, third thing of, of purse. Um, it also translates into this notion of uh, induction, deduction, and abduction as ways of reasoning. Uh, so this is, is a description of what one of the modes, uh, let's see if I go back to, there, let me go back to this. One of these modes, would look like this. So you have a knowledge pool, uh, you build a, a performance type of calculation and then you hook this up to reality, both input and output, that looks like this. So you have sensors, information comes in, you have actional effectors, uh, it goes out if you're running a pumping system or a biological system with this, you would have uh, data coming in, flow rates, pH, temperature, microbial sol or solids, microbial activity. And you're controlling this with effectors which go out with pump speeds, aeration speeds, recycle flows, that kind of stuff. And this is how you deal with that when you hook these up together. So if you have um, a system where you've got a, a biochemical level, you've got a, a cellular level, You've got a neurophysiological level and then a natural language level. Uh, you could use this, but you'd have to add it in an additional unit over here, which is what we do. So, um, so to go back to here, the, the notion is to take whatever kind of comes out of this stuff that Andreas and I are doing to, to make fourness. So we're going to add fourness to this kind of architecture. So instead of three here, they're going to be four. And instead of having these things connected with the tunis, a system relation to a system, which is this is all tunis, we're going to add fourness concept as well. So that's going to expand this architecture, and we're going to then apply it to all kinds of things. But one of them would be a timberfish system, where we have this notion of a biochemical level, a bacterial level, an animal level, and natural language. We're going to say that the biochemical level works with a free energy maximum entropy type of process. Uh, the microbial level works with a genetic algorithm. 
the animal level works with the neural net type of thing and the natural language works with Rogers wisdom or what do or relational symmetry paradigm or what have you. So that's how we would expand that. And then when we look at this structure, we say this structure is pretty good. You can hook it up with everything being connected to each other in other ways than just the input output. But there has to be a decision system. And in AI3 in the autonome, the decision system was what they call a PDM, a probabilistic uh, decision module. And it ran on basic stochastic uh, statistics, frequency functions, and it was similar to the big data uh, AI systems that are out there now in terms of how you were doing the computation. So what we would do, we would substitute that with maximum entropy and in particular, because maximum entry is pretty complicated to calculate, we would use this notion of a uh, what I call the Goldilocks maximum entropy principle, which essentially is based on that uh, old, old uh, fairy tale or what have you, Goldilocks and the three bears, where she made decisions based on whether it's too hot, too cold, or about right. In the beds, too soft, too hard, or about right. So you do that. So you end up with a maximum entropy equation where you have an entropy term and three expected value functions and three expected value functions will be, um, it's too hot, too cold or about right, too much, too little. But that turns out that's the way that artists really work. And that's the way that nature works. So how all this is gonna go, you know, we'll go back here is ecological intelligence. Well, this is the storyboard that I put together when we were doing uh, a big show at the end of 2019. I was developing respiratory issues again and, and COVID was about to hit. So I didn't use this board in the show, uh, but it's it's kind of like where I can see us going and where I think we'd, we'd like to go. Uh, and it's not that nature doesn't do the math, it doesn't do the math the way we do the math. That as you look at, at uh, natural systems, and you don't see anybody counting. Uh, maybe crows can count to three or something like that, but nobody's uh, nobody's using uh, complex numbers or, or even any kind of, of uh, real numbers, um, that sort of stuff. But nature does get the right answer. And so the notion is, it comes back to this notion of a quaternion, it, it, a hypothetical universal language is really can be used to derive quaternion structures and that that pervades during nature, then you you create the quaternion interpretation of maximum entropy and you can apply it throughout nature. So whereas uh, Andreas is talking about uh, collective reasoning as to how you get groups to reason together, and I think that's very much what we're trying here to do here with ecological intelligence. Only I can see ecological intelligence is maybe expanding that to include um, bacteria, to include neural nets and genetic algorithms and what have you. And it turns out that you can express uh, genetic algorithms and neural nets in terms of quaternions. Well, I've got a paper around it that shows how you can sort of do that. So that's part of the uh, the goal here. So uh, there's a lot going on with the details of this. <clears throat> so if there's time and you want to hear it, let me do a, a quick pitch deck on on uh, timberfish. Is that um, okay, Andres? Well, why don't we uh, do this? Uh, we have about eight minutes, um, and then we'll have to take a break and restart in 10 minutes because that's how our okay. works. Uh, so I would just like to, um, so why don't we save that deck for the second part? We'll start with that. Uh, at okay. this point, I just want to add from myself that um, uh, Jerry and I met about half a year ago through a math lecture. And uh, we realized that we've both been working on these languages of wisdom all our life. So this is the language of wisdom study group. We're just just starting, you know, we're reading each other's works and starting to realize this coincidence that we do have structures that are basically look the same. And uh, there happen to be similar uh, also to Charles Sanders Peirce, you know, many other thinkers. 
So what we're doing here is we've been trying to, uh, or we're taking the very first steps in understanding each other's structures, trying to understand why we have these coincidences, but we do want to apply it. And certainly um, Jerry has this whole life of applying uh, his ideas in the biological world, in the human uh, world. So we're wondering, uh, okay, how would we rethink that? So that spectrum of ideas from the philosophical to the biological, that's what we would like to discuss, um, everything in between. And um, so we have a few minutes to discuss um, our impressions, and then we'll have a round two in 10 minutes after that. Please. Ben, what are, what are you? Oh, Ari, please. Yeah, thank, thanks so much, Jerry, for a really stimulating talk. Uh, most of it went over my head, but um, I got the gist of it. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, firstly, really, really interesting uh, work that you're doing in terms of sustainability, right? I mean, I can imagine that the work that you're doing there is going to be vital in the impending apocalypse. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> <laughs> so we should talk. <laughs> <laughs> No. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I get I, I get the gist of what you what you're trying to get to, which is this almost it seems like the hints of Plato in there with universal yeah. forms. There's a little bit of that going on, isn't there? So. Um, so, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, so the applications that you've shown us are in obviously in the biological sphere. Um, so do you think that these um correlate also to how the mind works for example and things like that is that would you look at this as the kind of universal application yeah i definitely do because you can take the timberfish structure biochemical bacterial uh, neurological natural language and translate it into our human bodies uh, like 90 percent of our cells in the human body are bacteria now, they only account for about one to three percent of the cellular weight because they're very tiny and they're in their gut. So you got a bioreactor that we're carrying around in our gut. We've got this uh, brain neurological system um, with the biochemistry of the functions there. And, and we have natural language, <clears throat> which does impact on our health, the decisions we make and our attitudes and all of that sort of stuff. If you're uh, optimistic about life, you tend to be healthier than if you're pessimistic and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, it translates there. I have a, a beginning uh, sociological model as to how it would translate into this local, green, circular, sustainable economy in terms of defining money as a function of maximum entropy and then how you use to, to distribute that in a fair way and uh, to, to, to basically get rid of extreme wealth inequality, which I consider is the driving force of all evil here. So yeah, it applies across the board, I think. Thank you, that was great. Thank you, Jerry. If I may. So what I look at is, uh, I have a tendency to speak reductionist, uh, to break, try and break uh, uh, various systems into their components and in order to understand the interrelation of those components as far as material and energy flows and where uh, material and en energy can be harvested out of uh, um, a, a series of systems. Uh, uh, and there are all kinds of components that, you know, uh, can be used to, to harvest various, uh, uh, various materials and energy as, as, as it flows through the, the, uh, an integrated system of components. Yeah. So uh, I guess an initial question for you, Jir, is how do you think that that would apply to uh, the uh, philosophical concept uh, that you're discussing? Uh, philosophically, I, I think it, it's a uh, kind of the, the structure of knowledge. If, if you've got data, which is just raw numbers, you've got information, which is organized data, you've got knowledge, which is, is um, applied 
information and wisdom, which adds value to that as, as to control how it's applied based on some kind of ethical value scheme. So I think that gives you a, uh, a structure there that is mirrored in the biological world in our human bodies and, and what have you, but also in the, in the philosophical structure. And viewing that as, as language always continues to change in the sense that Wittgenstein would say, you know, a language is like the banks of a river and through its use, it continually changes and it changes the nature of the language as it evolves. And that, that is, a, again, a philosophical structure view of life. And I would look at it that way. This is about an expanded deck from what I wanted to show. So it's a, one that we used back in December of 2019 before we basically shut it down because of COVID. <clears throat> so uh, the pitch deck starts out with a little bit of who we are and what have you, the picture of the system in the very early stages when we built the first uh, thing there. We got a mission statement, um, relatively synced. You don't want too many words in these kinds of things. So it's uh, what the problem is, what the solution is, uh, why we think we're it. And we had a description of the technology, uh, the managed ecological process. We go through that, it takes organic substances. In this case, we were using uh, waste from a distillery and brewery, um, combine it together. A brief description of how it works. Microbes eat the organic materials and the wood chips and the nutrients. Invertebrates eat the microbes, fish and other seafood eat the invertebrates. Uh, we then had a bunch of discussions of uh, the commercial prototype, um, business strategy, and there's a lot of these things. So I'm just going to kind of blow through them, but if anybody wants to see them in detail, we can do that. Uh, business strategy, advantages to the planet, why we should do this, advantages to the client, why somebody who's running a business uh, would find this advantageous uh, description of the market, intellectual property. We have um, five patents issued in the US and one additional pending. It's an application we filed in 2007. They still haven't acted on it. And responded a number of times, but it's still valid. Anyway, the notion of the patents was to protect it in the US, but it's free for the rest of the world. And the, the reasoning there is that uh, the United States has pretty much caused the biggest chunk of the uh, climate change issues. And so I feel that they should pay for it a disproportionate amount. And so we would charge a royalty or a site license for anything work that's done in the United States or any fish that are sold in the United States. But anybody in, anywhere in the rest of the world is free to use the technology. These are pictures of the facility. Uh, this is an aerial picture that shows the initial system we built, the bioreactors over here. These are fish tanks with uh, chip filters on top of them. Uh, these are more chip filters to grow worms, um, various kinds of additional policy. And then we had a, a discharge line to come out. Um, this is what it looks like from the inside when it was running. Oops. Um, again, you can see the bioreactor areas, it's chip zones, fish zones, chip zones, fish zones. These are fish growing uh, tanks here. <clears throat> Some of the shrimp that we grew in the system, um, there are catfish that we grew in the system. And here are uh, some trout that we grew in the system. So that basically will do that. Let me see if I can find this uh, other one because it talks a little bit about uh, a model of this system that we built that could fit on a trailer so that you could drag it around and you could take it to a university or business or a community and plug it in and show how it worked. And then you could apply it so that you could create it as part of a, a local green economy 
that we can handle dining hall, dining hall or cafeteria wastes and produce fish that you could use in clean water and all that sort of stuff. This is a the trailer mounted system that essentially mimics this system, but it's on a small scale. And the advantage of that is that it's really good for educational type of purposes. It labels it, you can show this. It's got the bioreactor, it's got a worm farm, it's got a fish tank. This is a control process, which will monitor all of the things here and can control the pumps. And this little box right here could actually run the big system. And we can hook it up to the internet so that I can see what's going on from my office or just outside of Buffalo or wherever we have a system. So we built this. I took it up to my 50th reunion at Amherst um, as a demo unit. See if we can get somebody in the class to uh, want it. Here's some of my old classmates looking at it. But the, the group that really liked it were the students and a bunch of students, and they all love it. So the notion here, I'm explaining how this thing works, and you can see the parallels with the aeration zones, the chip zones, the worm farm, uh, the clarifier, or the biofilter over the clarifier, that blue thing. And the concept here is that we could uh, offer this kind of demo unit to a university. And if they have a sustainability program, you say, if you're willing to pay for the system, uh, you can have it. And we will we'll be happy to work with you and, and to serve as, as consultants to explain it. And you can run a, we can run a joint research program as to how it works and how it could be applied. And if you like that, on um, this little trailer mounted version of it, we could put in a, a big system, which would take all of your cafeteria and dining hallways, uh, could produce fish that you could then use in the dining hall and, and there. And the system also produces uh, clean water you take the residual wood chips after they've been used and uh, raw wood chips have a BTU value of 8,300 BTUs per pound. And after they've gone through this system, you get a 50% weight production, but the BTU value goes from 8,300 to 1,100. So now you've got a high energy wood chip residual that you can use to produce uh, electricity. So you can produce electricity, you can produce clean water, uh, you can generate fish. Um, and the residual that comes out would be a soil amendment, a, a slow release nutrient, very stable, very nutrient rich soil. So you can actually uh, um, supplement topsoils, you can recreate topsoils. So that's the, that's the concept. And that's one of the ways that I'm thinking of going uh, forward now is to work with universities who would like to put this kind of program in have enough money to pay the freight to to, uh, to buy the system, install the system, and we can work with them on a joint research program. Uh, I'm 81. I'm really looking for people who can take this going forward because I can't run this sort of stuff anymore. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's kind of where the uh, where the pitch deck for timberfish is at this point. I haven't used it in four years. So, Thank you, Jerry. And so now we have more questions, I think. Who would like to ask questions or make comments? Um, having looked at your at the uh, video, the half hour one, uh, as an overview of the system, Jerry, um, I see I see a lot of places where uh, there's a, a, a great deal of opportunity to add other components to the oh, system yeah. in order to generate yields. Um, I'm sure that you, as I go down this list of observations, you're going to say, yep, I thought of that. Yep, I thought of that. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, for, for one thing, uh, uh, you've got you. So you've got your 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 worm production. Um, what about uh, uh, using a thermophilic compost to harvest the heat energy off of that, especially if you're looking at uh, prawns uh, or freshwater prawns, right. they need the, the heat energy. Um, you also have a, a flow of carbon dioxide coming out of, of your hot compost, um, which could go back into uh, greenhouse production, which of course leads us to the vertical aeroponic system, which is pretty obvious that you've already right. kind of got that going, but the inf efficiency of that operation could be increased dramatically. Right. 
Um, the, the last, uh, well, I don't know about the last, but another observation is that your, your final, uh, re water recycle, uh, seems like you could, uh, uh have a, additional recovery, uh, yeah. that, uh, I would suggest, uh, uh, duckweed, uh, is a, is a, a general hyperaccumulator. Um, so, and, and this of course turns directly back into fish feed. So, uh, you, you could do the, the final polishing uh, of your of your water with the duckweed to remove the rest of the uh, dissolved uh, materials out of that and then turn that uh, in, in, back into f fish food with uh, duckweed um, or chicken food um, it, which of course if, if you're looking at the nitro from the chickens and, and of course the respiration of the chickens is putting out a lot of heat and a lot of carbon dioxide so uh, by integrating these other elements into your system, there's a whole bunch of places where more uh, yield can be captured. Right. Um, just, just observations. Right. Just a, a comment on that. You're absolutely right. I'm, and we're talking with people who've done soldier flies and, and lots of other types of, of applications. Uh, one of the things is that system there, we have a speedies permit, a state pollution discharge elimination system uh, permit with the state of New York. And we have very strict effluent criteria. We're four times more strict than the town of Westfield's permit for the wastewater treatment plant. And we can meet those numbers. So we can produce very, very clean water. And we've talked with the Mazas about actually using recycled water for processed water, wash water, and what have you up in their distillery and brewery. So there's all of that kind of stuff that is definitely possible. So yeah, it's it's a modular type of thing, and it can be adapted to a wide range of configurations. And and you you mentioned a few of them. Uh, back when I was doing bion in Florida, we worked with a company that was doing lemna, the duckweed type of thing. So I'm very familiar with those those types of things as well. But yeah, it's uh, it's wide open, and that's what I'm hoping for that we get a lot of uh, variants, spinoffs joint ventures, what have you. I don't want to go through another equity round of funding or grants. Those things drive you crazy, but I'm happy to collaborate with anybody else who wants to do that kind of crap and and go forward and uh, you know get this kind of technology out there. And that, the hope is that with this larger framework of the um, wondrous wisdom, the language of, of how it actually can be applied everywhere that, that I think can come out of this is, is uh, well, it's what I hope happens. But you're absolutely right. Lots of potential applications. Harry? One more that's really, oh. that's really pretty interesting. There's a company out in uh, California, AquaCycle, that is generating electricity from wastewater. It's a combined uh, anaerobic, aerobic type of, of system. And they build these little electrical generators that run off of um, sewage or waste, uh, but they're constrained by size. They're about the size of a car battery. So you hook a whole bunch of them together, ridiculously expensive. But I think we can make a, a variety of that, a version of that that would work to generate electricity directly from the bioreactor. So you put electrodes down in those chip cells and, and pull out DC current. So anyway, that's a research project. There's all kinds of crazy stuff like that. So go ahead, Andrew. Sorry. I just wanted to invite Ari. Uh, do you have a, you had a question before? Do you have a, the same question, a different question? No, thanks, Andreas. Um, uh, yeah. So one one uh, on the on your innovations here. So uh, I, am I right in thinking that you derive your uh, creations here from your sort of language, your first principles, if you like. Yeah. So it's derived from that. Is that so you have a sort of biological scientific outcome from your philosophical inquiry? Is that right? They, they actually emerged uh, together. So when I started building the biological systems like the microbial tank farm, and then after starting when I was working at the wastewater plant, I started inventing languages. So the language is sort of involved as the as the biological process control system, the relational paradigm, symmetry paradigm, that kind of stuff. So they've they fed on each other and they've been influenced by each other. And they've also <laughs> been incredibly influenced by my wife and her work, the aesthetic 
vision as to how she works. She has a superior way of understanding the world than I do because she can see answers and understand things that I can muddle around for a long time mathematically and scientifically and and she's way ahead of me. So I'm trying to incorporate that kind of capability. That's partly why I say nature doesn't do the math. Well, artists don't do the math in the same way that, that nature doesn't. And I don't, we're, we're trying to get that. And Andreas, who I see is not really a mathematician, but he's a philosopher, an artist, a performer, and a mathematician. So that that's why it fits very much with what he's doing, what I'm doing, what we're going to try and do together. And I want to piggyback on that question uh, with a similar question. You're working on this whole spectrum from the most concrete things in life to, you know, and the most abstract things in life and all the way in between. Now, suppose somebody uh, from the industry says, well, I can see why I'd like to have an intelligent system, let's say, that's working with this resource management, waste management stuff. I just don't see what the point of the philosophy is, right? Like, why is that relevant here? So I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, I think uh, there, there's two frameworks of that. One, uh, you mentioned the uh, collective reasoning mm -hmm. type of thing. And, and in a way, that kind of what you wrote there kind of answers that question. Uh, the other uh, observation is that I made, and this goes back, you know, I've been suspicious for quite a while, but I really became after COVID shut us down and I started looking at things that doing advanced technology or technology is not going to solve things like climate change. Uh, and you have to deal with political realities. And that means you have to deal with how people think. And so we really need something that can do that and, and to deal with what I call informational disease. Uh, if, you, if you look at everything is true and false, a binary choice, you can't deal with things like the statement is false, it's not true or false. So you have to have a, a third component. You get into your threesome type of stuff. Um, and you have to, um, in a certain sense, we live in a leper colony. A lot of people can't think for crap. And we have to give them a tool. This goes back to the Bucky Fuller quote. You know, you don't try and change the way they think. You give them a tool that will change the way they think. That's the language. And that's where your language, wondrous wisdom, may be better than Odo do my language, but to give them the tool to do it. Because I think that it goes back to the wealth and extreme wealth inequality, which drives, I think, you know, fascism, racism, sexism. We've got to be able to show how that is really antithetical to both personal happiness and the social uh, viability of, the, of our species and, and the planet itself. So it, it all ties back together, I think, as to why you need, you can't go with just the me mechanistic thing. And I, I run into the engineers and say, well, yeah, we can just do this. Uh, but then it gets monetized and, and you end up making decisions, not in terms of environmental impact, but on profitability. And uh, So at this point, again, I'd like to jump in with my own slides, uh, which yep. to this point, you'll get a sense of both of our languages of wisdom and how they could relate, uh, I think, to this uh, to these issues. This is Jerry's. Um, and uh, when you see this, when you see my stuff, you'll see similarities. So uh, I won't be maybe uh, completely accurate, but but just I'll, I'll be as good as I can. Working with uh, John Ray Hammond. Um, and so uh, this is, they were, you know, great minds think alike. But uh, there, one was this notion of relations. So this is the 70s, 60s, the idea of you know complex systems and what do they look like? What are they built up from? So the idea is that you can have a self-relation. This is just a dot. Then you can have a relation between, let's say, two things. And uh, the way that uh, it took me a long time to realize, I think this is true. Though the way uh, Jerry would think about it, he's actually drawing it. You know, like it's a line, and he's drawing it, and he's thinking as he's drawing. Okay, so he's saying, okay, look, you can have a self-relation, a dot, but then you can have a line that goes from a dot to a dot. Then you can have a line that goes from a dot to a line. Okay, so this is a, a relation with a relation. Uh, and this is, uh, you can have a line between two lines. It's like a relation between two relations. Okay, so, and there's something deep about this. And so, but that's basically, this is kind of like thinking by drawing in a certain sense. Now, there's a famous um, book, um, well, it has a cult following called The Laws of Form. So George Spencer Brown, at, at very similar time, I think late 60s, 
uh, came up with this uh, version of Boolean logic that's based on uh, just making a distinction. Just make a distinction and think of that. And then you get these, we call it like the form. And then you get these spaces on spaces. You get this whole boundary logic, but it's basically Boolean logic. And so I won't go into that, but this is something that is expressing that. Now, in my language of wondrous wisdom, I came to very similar things in a completely different way. I was trying to describe uh, human experience. I was trying to look at absolute truth. So I came up with structures um, that were like, and I'll show them maybe later. We both relate to Pierce. And so Pierce has this one firstness, secondness, thirdness. Just, you may know this, but just to review, deduction is like this logical thinking. Like, so if all the beans in the bag are white and you take some beans, logically, of course, it's the deduction that's gonna follow. Induction is almost like the opposite. Like, you know, if some of the beans in the bag are white, you know, you take one, you take another, you take a third, you take a hundred beans, they're all white. Well, maybe all of them are white. You know, you have this kind of, uh, from the facts you generate a rule. And Pierce said, for the scientific method, you are using a third way of uh, reasoning, which he called abduction. And it basically said, look, there's some beans near the bag and they're white. I think those beans came from the bag, right? That's a good guess. But he tried to argue, like, what makes for a good guess? He said, well, a good guess is one that reduces surprise, okay? So, like, once you think this, then you go, oh, then it's not so surprising because they probably did come from that bag. You know, this not just fell out of the sky. So this is uh, deduction, induction, abduction, which are common to us both. Now, in the one of the ways I think, and this, usually I'm an idealist, this can be supported materialistically uh, if you've read... Uh, Kahneman's book, Thinking uh, Fast and Slow. But there's a three-mind model of consciousness. So he talks about a system one, which basically is our unconscious. And so from Pierce's point of view, like this is a, like the unconscious knows the right answer. It's, mon it's monic. It's just all united. Google will tell you the one right answer. What's your favorite ice cream? But then there's the conscious that kind of monitors it. Okay, it's like the rational mind. So the so the guessing is taking place. The association building is this abduction is taking place in the unconscious, but the deduction is taking place in the conscious. And one way to think about it is to say, look, what if I get rid of all my experience? Right? There's some kind of thinking fresh to just you know let go of all your experience and just look at yourself with an empty mind. Spill everything out of your vessel. That's conscious. Okay. So that'd be system two, it's deliberate, it's slow. And what I'm claiming is that there's a third level uh, called consciousness, which matches the two. So you have emotion, they're supposed to be in sync. So here's a unconscious, it's like a hundred billion neurons that are all connected. Here's a language of concepts, maybe a hundred thousand concepts is trying to model that. This mind thinks it knows, this mind saying, well, but what if we don't know? Okay, it's conceptual. The consciousness is keeping them matched. Okay, and it's basically holding a break. You get emotion from the con unconscious. This uh, second uh, conscious is trying to remodel, but the conscious is saying, wait, 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 I'll tell you when you're matched and then I'll set it. Okay, so that's a simple three mind uh, model. Now, living inside, so that can be argued materialistically, but living inside, what does it look like? On the one hand, you'll have like a three cycle of taking a stand, following through, reflecting. That's like a scientific method. On the other hand, you'll also experience a four uh, levels of knowledge, like whether, what, how, why, okay? And if you think of whether as a base, you can be adding one level of a reflection, like a, the unconscious would be like a perspective, the conscious would be like a perspective on a perspective, kind of like, you know, so the unconscious is like, I am all this, okay? But the conscious would say, get rid of I, let's say you, right? Like you say this, right? And then the consciousness will look on the sign like third person. So. This is um, just some of the type of things I think about. In fact, I have like, a, this is a whole system of these uh, different ways of dividing everything. So this is like in the consciousness, you know, so you can imagine like a butterfly lives in a world of icons. That's like the unconscious pictures. You know, a bacteria has direct real, touch, touches reality directly. A but butterfly lives in a world of pictures. A mouse is able to model attention. It's able to have a model of itself and you know pointers. But like an orangutan is able to have this type of thing, like, well, I'm going to divide my mind into two parts for free will and fate, three parts for the scientific method, four parts for knowledge and so on. It turns out it collapses and it keeps going round and round. It's like a very tight structure that this consciousness is operating in. And what it's doing is saying like, 
all I do to control my, most of my life is on autopilot, but I sit back and I just decide, am I going to be a little bit more liberal or a little bit more conservative or what? So you can build languages of this, the kind of languages you'd want, like a, of how things happen would be narration, you know, how do things get meaning, verbalization, how do things come to matter would be argumentation. You can, um, one of the kinds of things I do is look at biology, like uh, what are all the ways of figuring things out in biology? Study biologists, they have 24 ways. You can, they organize very nicely. You get a definition of life as a system for managing traits of success, you know, which is basically harmony. Now, this is the system that, um, uh, this is that autonomics that we're talking about, that you may have seen this. So I want to show like how I would think about that. And so just I'll, I'll maybe discuss this with Jerry more in the future, but just basically say, like, I would say maybe we don't need this knowledge. We really have two, three cycles and they're working in different directions. And so, like, when I think of taking a stand following through, I'm thinking about like experiments with myself. I'm perfecting myself. So I make a careful decision. You know, what am I going to take a stand on? Then I probe the world. I live my life and probe it in all kinds of creative ways, you know, making creative guesses, you know, doing creative engagements. Then I reflect and see what happens. Now, with the scientific method, it turns out you, you're not perfecting yourself, you're perfecting knowledge. So you make a boundary between yourself and the world, you're watching from afar. So you make a guess of hypothesis, it doesn't have to be that serious, but you make a very, uh, when you take a stand, but when you follow through, you make a very careful uh, experiment, you set up your experiment very carefully, and then you, um, then you um, reflect and then, you know, you can be creative with your hypotheses. So what's happening here in this module is that when we engage the environment, it's through these guesses, it's through this creative probing. We're perfecting ourselves. So we have this knowledge in all these states and we're building up a system that's like, mon we're echoing, we're evoking a system that kind of like models us. So you get this self-knowledge and it works in the opposite direction. So our behavior evokes a system of self-knowledge. And then that becomes the new input for the next system. So we can be understanding the world. We can be, um, that'll yield to self-understanding as a person in particular. We're some, you know, unconscious mind that's very personal, personality. Then we say, okay, but let's model that. Uh, let's pull out the water out of that vessel. And so you get the conscious mind, which is something that can be shared. The problem with the unconscious, you don't get any language that you could share with other people. But if you empty out all the experience, you can look at yourself, say, hey, look, we all have this in common. We have, and we can speak a conceptual language that does a pretty good job. Then we can have a good understanding like that orangutan, where we can take a model of our whole mind and see, like, how are we dividing up the neuronic, you know, global brain interface, you know, brain space, workspace. And so we'll get different things. And basically, like, uh, to be very brief, but this relationship with God to say, you know, God would be modeled by no perspectives, you know, but we end up using these perspectives. It's like the relationship between a lost child and their parent, you know, like a child is lost, but they should not look for their parent. Their parent should look for them. The child, if they're wise, will go where their parent will find them. So this idea, which is important in ecology, is like, look, you need to know the difference between yourself and the bigger picture, right? And so if you think about this, what it's really doing, there's not more levels going down. This God is like how we reinterpret the world, that behind this world is a God. And so it's like a three cycle again. So this is the type of thing I do. Um, um, that's what I want to show. And maybe the conclusion, just to say, like the ways I'm thinking about, um, uh, the ways I'm riffing or improvising on what I'm learning from Jerry, is um, two. One is that uh, if, like uh, Ben was suggesting, we had a spirit of uh, invention, uh, application around the world, we're saying, look, do things locally, work with your resources locally of all kinds, here are possible solutions. And so we had like an econet, like instead of just an internet, we had an econet where people are doing it themselves all around the world, sharing solutions, learning from solutions, and especially reporting their failures, et cetera. So that'd be one thing. The other thing is that like, as you see, these systems evoke. So if you, they're evoking a spirit, they're evoking a consciousness. So you can make a little argument to say, look, if we have a well-maintained, you know, well-loved, 
system. Like if you love a puppy, it's stepping in with its unconscious, stepping, I mean, stepping out with its conscious, stepping in, stepping out. If you love a puppy so that it's stepping in and stepping out, it can become, have consciousness. If you love a baby in this way, where sometimes, you know, it stepped out, you step in, it steps in, you step out. You play in a flirt with that boundary where it can choose whether to step in or step out. It can be conscious. So practically anything could be conscious in the consciousness sense. If you create this environment of love where you allow it to be selfish and then you allow it to let go of its selfishness and you flirt with that boundary. So these are two like ways of applying this type of thing, which may be out of the box. That's what I wanted to share. Jerry? <laughs> It's going to be cool. I mean, how how we put these kind of worldviews together yeah. and, and uh, stuff. I'm really excited about it. I think the uh, the similarities, uh, parallels, symmetries, whatever we want to call them, are tremendous. And uh, there's a real translation issue that we're going to work through. Uh, and I think that is going to produce terrific things. I'm not quite sure what yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. And I think it's... Uh, it's going to be fun. It's a real pleasure. I think it's going to be very important for the planet and uh, for humanity. So, I so Ari and Ben, uh, we have like one minute each for you. If you would just uh, say whatever you want. <laughs> of course, we would love to meet with you again. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I loved um, your uh, presentation, uh, Andreas. It was really, really uh, juicy, packed, lots in there. Uh, actually, you know, obviously both of your presentations were packed. Um, so thank you both very, very much. Um, I don't know. I, for me, it seems like at the heart, because my research is on human flourishing from a philosophical perspective um, and uh, primarily through philosophy of language. Um, so that's why I love uh, Wittgenstein and all of his insights. Um, and so I, I argue for a, a greater world through conceptual understanding. And I think that we have so much um, uh, misinformation or, if you like, manipulated language, you know, it, it distorts, you know, how we think in the world and it's ordinary citizens, you know. So it takes a high, it takes an incredible amount of work to battle against all of that avalanche of bullshit that's out there all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so it's, it, we don't really have the sort of culture that is amenable to these great insights and, and, and great revolutions at the moment. So, um, so one way that I'm trying to tackle it is by doing local events, community events that, um, uh, local community members talk about flourishing. They use uh, mind mapping, brainstorming, visual imagery, all sorts of different methods to, understand better what flourishing means for them um you know guided by a good host and facilitator basically so um you know i think there is this kind of if you like meta level that you guys are operating at <laughs> and then we've got this ground ground level as well this sort of grassroots level and i'm also dealing with stuff at the policy level and obviously in academia as well so um yeah just very exciting to to hear your uh, your thoughts both of you thank you so much Thank you. And Ben? Yeah, we, we see, uh, like, for example, CD3WD, uh, which unfortunately Alex is no longer with us, or we could go to him for a lot of this programming, but uh, is a massive knowledge base that much of the how uh, that's already been developed has been cataloged. Uh, and and so you got CD3WD, you have a, a collaborative platforms like Appropedia, uh, for example, and is, didn't you and I, isn't that where you and I came in, I think, was at the uh, Aprocopedia conference back in 2000, whatever. Um, so we have, uh, uh, these collaborative platforms where people can, uh, uh, cooperate on, on solutions. And, uh, Alex, before he died, was working on a, uh, uh, collaborative d d voting model, which would have, uh, uh, eliminated the representative uh, democracy uh, the, and the, the corresponding political political class of representatives in favor of a of a referendum, um, and uh, yeah, I think MI six got him for that, and that's what happened to him. But um, we, we so have just we a, have these tools. We have just a few seconds, so I just yeah. want to conclude with a prayer because uh, and my prayer is the grateful like. 
even a small number of people, we have this huge uh, divine diversity, you know, and so we want to be brought together, held together. Thank you uh, all. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work. And um, we just we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And you know, I'm just I'm grateful, and you know, I I want to support that, and you know, our weekly or bi you know semi-weekly or bi-weekly conversations have been have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So, yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.